Good evening again, and welcome, welcome, welcome. I am the Reverend Ainita Pearl Adesanya. I serve Willamette University as chaplain and director of spiritual and religious life. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening on behalf of both the university and the Salem Peace Lecture Committee. Welcome to this 33rd annual Salem Peace Lecture. Let me begin by acknowledging that the city of Salem and Willamette University were established on the land of the Kalapuya, who today are represented by the Confederate tribes of the Grand Ronde and the Confederate tribes of the Siletz Indians whose relationship with this land continues to this day. We offer gratitude for the land itself, for those who have stewarded it for generations, and for the opportunity to study, to learn, to work, and to be in community on this land. We acknowledge that Salem's history, like many others, is fundamentally tied to the first colonial developments in the Willamette Valley. We respectfully acknowledge and honor past, present, and future indigenous stewards of this land and this community. This evening officers, uh, offers us an opportunity to engage with a critical, a critical and looming issue today the possibility of a nuclear crisis, the necessity of nuclear disarmament, and what we can do about it. Thank you for coming out tonight, and thank you to those of you on live stream, coming to learn and to consider how we will, how we will and or may move forward together in the face of this global threat. Our speaker, Dr. Ira Helfand, is a longtime humanitarian and educator of the devastating effects of nuclear weapons. Our honoree tonight, bear with me, Pineros y Campesinos y Nudos del Noroeste, if I got that close enough, also known, known as the Coon have served as a local moral giant for decades, supporting farm workers and empowering our Latinx communities. You will hear more about their work soon. This event is made possible by the generous support of the conveners and sponsors whose names are in your programs. We acknowledge them and we offer our sincere Thank you and appreciation for your support. This event is moreover made possible through the hard work of a small group of volunteers that make up the Salem Peace Lecture Committee. I would ask for those of you who are here to raise your hand just for a bit of acknowledgement. The, act, the current members, there are other members who have been former members and I invite you to raise your hands as well. And so now, as I read, I invite you to receive just a bit of an opening, a reading by Sibylla Alaramo titled, Yes to the Earth. Yes to the Earth so radiant in certain morning's light, with its roses and its cypress trees, is earth, or with its grain and olives. So suddenly it is radiant on the soul, which stands then alone and forgetful, though just a moment earlier, the soul wept bloody tears and dwelt in bitterness. So radiant in certain morning's light is earth, 
and in its silence, so expressive. This wondrous lump rolling in its skies, beautiful, tragic in solitude, yet smiling. That the soul, unasked, replies yes, replies yes to the earth. To the indifferent earth, yes. Even though next instant skies should darken roses too, and cypresses, or the effort of life grow heavier still. The act of breathing, breathing even more heroic, yes, replies the battered soul to earth, so radiant in the light of certain mornings, beautiful above all things and human hope. It is my pleasure now to introduce to you Isabella Galpo, who will present tonight's Salem Peacemaker Award. Good evening. My name is Isabella Gapo, and I serve as the Willamette Student Liaison to the Salem Peace Lecture Committee. For the past 33 years, the Salem Peace Lecture has honored a local peacemaker for outstanding efforts in bettering communities. Today, it is my honor to present the 2022 Peacemaker of the Year Award to the local organization Pineros y Campesinos Unidos del Noroeste, also known as PACUN. PACUN is a state as a statewide farm workers union that's based in Woodburn, who has provided leadership, advocacy, and people power to improving the lives of farm workers since 1976. PICUN works to combat the long standing inequities that farm workers and working Latinx families face by advocating at both the state and national levels for safer working conditions and fair wages. Accepting today's award today is Ceci Hinojos, who serves as the operations and finance director for PICUN. At this time, I'd like to invite Ceci Hinojos to the stage to share a few words on Pakun's behalf. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, on behalf of my organization, I say thank you. It really is such an honor to be awarded the peacemaker, this Peacemaker Award. I know that our, my organization, the organization of farm workers here in Oregon, uh, farm worker union, constantly fighting to uphold the tenets of our 80 original founders, which was to fight back against exploitation and all its effects. We've worked tirelessly since 1976 in various iterations with the Willamette Valley Immigration Project, which has, is still seen today with our Farm Worker Service Center, and in 1985 with the formalizing of our union, and even the new iteration today that many of you might be more familiar with um, from 2018, where we've worked tirelessly to make sure that our underrepresented and underserved communities have gotten the representation that they deserve, such as in 2016 when we worked to elect the first indigenous Latina into the Oregon State Legislature, which was Teresa Alonso Leon. Recently, as well, with our win in the Salem Kaiser School Board of electing three Latinx identifying candidates to represent a district that has a majority population of Latino students and had not had the opportunity to see themselves represented in that way. And even more so recently, with our passage of farm worker overtime that provides overtime pay for those that are putting their lives on the line nowadays to be able to make sure that we have food on our tables. 
And speaking of putting their lives on the line, they worked tirelessly through this pandemic and also through heat domes and wildfire smoke. And which is why we also advocated with OSHA to pass the strongest heat and smoke worker protections in the entire country. Because everyone deserves not over, only overtime pay for their hard labor, but also the right to safe, healthy workplaces where they can rest easy, not having to worry about breathing in toxic air, and also have access to breaks with cool water and in shady areas. Many things that we consider basic necessities, but those that are harvesting our food have had to go without. So again, on behalf of Pekun, thank you so much. And now I'd like to welcome to the podium, Dr. Andy Harris. Uh, Dr. Harris serves on the advisory board for the Oregon Physician, Physicians for Social Responsibility, also known as PSR, and is a distinguished former member of the Salem Peace Lecture Committee. I don't know about distinguished, but it's nice to be back here in Salem. Um, this is the uh, 33rd iteration of the Peace Lecture, so congratulations for all that have been working on that. <clears throat> well, it gives me terrific pleasure, if I can open my notes here, there we go, uh, to welcome uh, a dear friend of mine uh, that I've known for over 30 years, Ira Helfand. Um, Ira has uh, uh, been an emergency doctor for much of his career. Uh, he's a board certified internist, uh, recently retired. Um, and he hails from uh, Northampton, Massachusetts. He spent much of his career uh, treating acute medical issues, acute medical problems, conditions of his patients. But Ira has also spent his life trying to prevent a more, uh, uh, a more chronic condition, and that is the potential catastrophe of nuclear war. And this is to this that he's really devoted his life. Ira is the only person that I know of that has uh, been awarded um, or been the co-recipient of two Nobel Peace Ar uh, Awards. Uh, one in 1985 with the International Physician for the Prevention of Nuclear War, and then again in 2017 with ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Uh, Ira is the co-founder and the immediate past president of IPPNW, and he is a co-founder and a member of the International Steering Group of ICANN. He's also a co-founder of Physicians for Social Responsibility, where he has led the security program for at least 40 years, I think. Um, Ira has also published in various prestigious journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet, the British Medical Journal, the World Medical Journal, uh, on the consequences of nuclear war. And he's lectured uh, on nuclear war uh, around the globe in Russia, China, Japan, Korea, India, Pakistan, Israel, Turkey, Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, and across Europe and across the United States. So it's a real pleasure and it's an honor to welcome an international expert and also a dear friend, Dr. Ira Helfand. Good evening. Thanks, Andy, for that very kind introduction. And, and thanks to Willamette and to the Salem Peace Lecture Committee for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Um, and thank you all for coming, because what I need to talk about is not very pleasant, and I suspect you all know that. And I, I appreciate your being willing to be part of this conversation. I, I, I used to be very apologetic talking about nuclear war, but in recent years, I've come to feel that we really 
have only two alternatives. We can talk about nuclear war and figure out what to do to prevent it, as unpleasant and difficult as that is, or, or we can experience a nuclear war, which would be even much more unpleasant and difficult. Because that's the reality that we're facing today. We are closer to nuclear war than we've ever been, according to the experts. And this is very hard for us to accept and understand. A generation ago, maybe two generations, back in the 1980s, we all understood the enormous danger posed by nuclear weapons. It, it dominated our thinking when people were asked, what are the biggest problems facing the world today? Preventing nuclear war was number one and number two on everyone's list. We had nuclear nightmares. There were movies about nuclear war. You couldn't get away from it. And that was important in, in, in a positive sense because it made us think about the problem and it made us take action, and, and people did. Millions of people across the United States, across Europe, in Japan, in Australia, in the Soviet Union, demanding action to lessen the danger of nuclear war. Here in the United States, we formed something called the Freeze Campaign to promote the idea that at that time when both the United States and the Soviet Union had in the range of 30,000 nuclear warheads, we should stop making more. We should freeze the arms race and then work backwards to get rid of the weapons. And in response to an enormous public out outcry, that came to be the policy of the United States and the Soviet Union. And it was an extraordinary development. In, in the summer of 1983, the United States deployed weapons in Europe that were specifically designed to enable us to launch a nuclear war against the Soviet Union in the mistaken belief that we could fight and win such a war. And that was explicitly stated by the President of the United States to be his goal, the ability to carry out such a war. We almost had that war twice in 1983. And yet, less than a year and a half later, that same president, Ronald Reagan, sat down with Mikhail Gorbachev, and they said together, nuclear war can never be won, and it must never be fought. And it was like a 180 degree change in the nuclear policies of both countries, something that no one two years before would have imagined to be possible. And that bit of history, I think, is enormously important to us today, because I think we have some of the same sense of fatalism about our ability to deal with nuclear war that many of us felt in the 1980s. It just seemed like it couldn't change. We couldn't end the Cold War arms race. We can't get rid of nuclear weapons today. But the history shows us that we can bring about these kinds of profound changes. So I'd like to talk to you tonight first about why we need to be worried, what's happening in the world that is making nuclear war more likely, Secondly, I'd like to remind us all of what is at stake here, what is going to happen if nuclear weapons are used. And third and most importantly, I want to talk about what we can do about it. Let me start with, with why we're all so worried today. When the Cold War ended in 1989, 1990, all of us living then really felt that the danger of nuclear war had passed. I, I think all of us can remember the palpable relief when the Berlin Wall came down, the sense that we'd somehow dodged a bullet, that this thing, we, this, this, this threat which had consumed our imagination and dominated our lives, we'd survived it somehow. We weren't going to have to worry about this anymore. And the problem was that the danger hadn't gone away. There were still thousands of nuclear warheads in the world, and the possibility that as time passed, conflict would grow again. And that's exactly what's happened. Right now, relations between the United States and Russia are the worst they have been since the Cold War. Uh, they've taken a dramatic downturn with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But even before that, experts like William Perry, the former Secretary of Defense, were advising us that the situation was already more dangerous than the Cold War. That was before Ukraine. Relations between the United States and China are the worst they've been in 40 years, since the 1970s. And there is a real potential for military conflict between the United States and China over Taiwan, and a real possibility that that conflict could escalate to nuclear war. A third area of great concern is North Korea. A few years ago, when President Trump and President uh, Kim were exchanging threats and insults, 
this was very much in the news. It's not so much in the news today, but it should be. The North Koreans have carried out a number of recent missile tests, and there are predictions that they will test nuclear weapon again in the coming weeks or months. And then there is a situation in South Asia which gets very little attention here in the United States, but which may be the most frightening of all. Uh, India and Pakistan both have significant nuclear arsenals, and they've gone to war four times in their short history as independent nations since the 1940s. They almost went to war again on two occasions in 2019. And experts in South Asian affairs are quite clear in their belief that if India and Pakistan go to war again, this will become a nuclear war. And as I will describe to you uh, in, in a few minutes, that war, should it happen in South Asia, will be a catastrophe, not just for the people of the Indian subcontinent, but for the entire planet, including those of us who live here in the United States. So those are four geopolitical flashpoints, if you will, uh, all of which have become much more dangerous in the last four, five, six years, and all of which are raising the danger of nuclear war. There are two other factors that we need to consider. One is the development of cyber technology. We now have to confront the reality that a terrorist group could potentially hack into the command and control systems of one or another of the nuclear weapon states and either directly launch that country's nuclear missiles or perhaps more likely create a false alert, get the country that is being hacked to believe that it is under nuclear attack and induce it to launch its own weapons against this imagined threat. This is a real nightmare. The people who are responsible for US military cybersecurity acknowledge privately that they don't know how to respond to this fully. It, it's generally acknowledged that when you're talking about cyber terrorism, the aggressor, the, the offensive side, has the advantage because the defense doesn't know what's going to come at them next. They don't know what kind of malware it's going to be, what kind of a program is going to infiltrate their computer systems. And we maintain hundreds of nuclear warheads, as do the Russians, on missiles, all ready to go. They're just awaiting a command, which can come from the leaders of those countries or perhaps from a terrorist. The final factor that we need to be cognizant of is the role that climate change is playing. And people don't often think of the nuclear threat and the climate crisis as being this closely related, but they are. All of the countries which have nuclear weapons, the nine states which possess the 13,000 warheads in the world, all nine of these countries have said publicly that they favor the elimination of all nuclear weapons someday in the future when the world is safer. The problem is that the world isn't getting safer. The climate crisis is making the world more dangerous. And over the coming months and years, even if we do everything that we're supposed to to try to limit the danger posed by the climate crisis, large portions of this planet are going to find themselves unable to support the human populations that live there now. This is going to trigger migration on a scale unprecedented in human history. It's going to trigger conflict within countries and conflict between countries. And if nuclear weapons are still on the table as this conflict unfolds, they're going to be used. So for all of these reasons, we have to understand that nuclear war is not some historical phenomenon that we have outgrown. This is a threat which exists, which is present, and which in many senses is growing. So let's talk for a few minutes about what happens if these weapons actually go off. I want to start by describing a large-scale nuclear war as might take place between the United States and Russia. And I want to begin that discussion by describing what would happen to a large city using today's nuclear warheads. Many of us have images in our minds of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We've seen the pictures of the devastation of those two cities. And Hiroshima and Nagasaki are important warnings to us about what nuclear weapons can do. But the most important thing that we need to know about what happened in Japan in 1945 is that it does not begin to prepare us for the level of destruction that will occur if nuclear weapons are used again. Because if the United States and Russia go to war, it's not going to be one or two bombs of 15 kilotons, 15,000 tons of TNT. It's going to be hundreds of bombs each of which will be anywhere from 100 to 800 kilotons, falling on many cities. So I, I use 
the example of New York. It's the largest city in the United States and a, a clearly a major target in the event that there is a war. We don't know for sure how many weapons are targeted at New York, but the best estimate is that it's at least 15 to 20 uh, and that these bombs are indeed in the range of 100 to 800 kilotons. I use a model of a single 20 megaton, 20 million ton explosion to describe what would happen. The megatonnage in my model is actually a little bit bigger than the megatonnage that will probably uh, engulf New York. The destruction I'm going to describe is actually less because you cause more damage by setting off many smaller bombs spread out over the area that you're trying to destroy. But it's hard to sort of visualize all these different bombs going off at the same time, and the model of a single explosion, I think, gives us an adequate picture of what we are facing. Within a thousandth of a second of the detonation of that bomb, a fireball would form, reaching out for two miles in every direction, four miles across. Within this area, temperatures would rise to 20 million degrees Fahrenheit, hotter than the surface of the sun, and everything would be vaporized. The buildings, the trees, the people, the upper level of the earth would disappear to a distance of four miles in every direction. The explosion would generate winds greater than 600 miles per hour and blast pressures greater than 25 pounds per square inch. Mechanical forces of that magnitude can destroy anything that human beings can build. A building like the one we're sitting in would be absolutely leveled by an explosion of this magnitude. To a distance of six miles in every direction, the heat would be so intense that automobiles would melt. And to a distance of 16 miles in every direction, the heat would still be so intense that everything flammable would burn. Cloth, paper, wood, plastic, gasoline, heating oil, it would all ignite. Hundreds of thousands of fires, which over the next half hour would coalesce into a giant firestorm, 32 miles across, covering over 800 square miles. Within this entire area, the temperature would rise to 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. All of the oxygen would be consumed, and every living thing would die. In the case of New York, we're talking about 12 to 15 million people dead in a half an hour. And if this were part of a large-scale war between the United States and Russia, this kind of destruction would take place at every major city in both countries. And if NATO were involved in the war, most of the great cities of Europe and Canada as well. All told, we would be talking about something in the order of 200 to perhaps as many as 400 million people dead in an afternoon. In addition, the entire economic infrastructure of all of these countries would be destroyed. There'd be no internet. There'd be no electric grid. There'd be no food distribution system, no system to distribute heating oil or natural gas to warm homes. There'd be no public health system, no banking system. There'd be nothing. None of the things that we all depend on to keep ourselves alive. And over the months following this initial attack, the vast majority of people living in all of these countries directly involved in the fighting would also die from exposure, from radiation poisoning, from hunger, from epidemic disease. But this is only part of the story because the 3,000 or so warheads in the U.S. and Russian arsenals, the fires that they would start would loft 150 million tons of soot into the upper atmosphere, blocking out the sun, dropping temperatures across the planet, cutting precipitation, opening up a giant hole in the ozone layer, uh, allowing ultraviolet light through to the surface. Temperatures across the world would drop an average of 18 degrees Fahrenheit. In the interior regions of North America and Eurasia, the temperatures would drop 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. We have not seen temperatures on this planet that cold in 18,000 years, since the coldest moment of the last ice age. And under these conditions, all of the ecosystems that have evolved since the end of that ice age would collapse. Food production across the planet would stop, and the vast majority of the human race would starve to death. 
A study that was published in the journal Nature in August of this year, using population figures from 2010, showed that of the six and a half billion people on Earth at that time, over five billion would die in the famine following a war between the United States and Russia. If you extrapolate the numbers to current uh, conditions, it's over six billion people dead. But that same study also showed something else that's very frightening, which is that it would not take a large-scale war between the United States and Russia to cause a global disaster. Even a much more limited war, as might take place between India and Pakistan, would have worldwide catastrophic effects. The study examined a number of different scenarios, looking at uh, different numbers of warheads and different sizes of warheads. What they found was that in a war between India and Pakistan that involved just 250 warheads altogether, both sides, uh, if those warheads were 100 kilotons each, over 100 million people would die in South Asia, a complete disaster for the subcontinent. But again, it's the global climate disruption that would cause the greater destruction. That war wouldn't lift 150 million tons of soot in the upper atmosphere, but it would lift 37 million tons. And it would drop temperatures across the Earth about 8 degrees Fahrenheit. Not quite as cold, but still getting into ice age, the Ice Age range. And as a result of that climate disruption, food production across the planet would drop enough that a global famine would ensue, and a famine that would kill, in this case, over 2 billion people. Now, the death of either 2 billion people or 5 billion people would not necessarily lead to the extinction of our species. It would be the end of civilization as we know it. No civilization in human history has ever withstood a shock of this magnitude, and there is absolutely no reason to believe that the very complex, delicate economic system that we all depend on would survive disruption on this scale. So that's the danger that's looming out there. And it's important for us to understand the things I've described. This is not the plot for a grade B movie. This is the peril that we face as long as we allow these weapons to continue to exist. So why talk about this? It, it's depressing. It's frightening. Why put ourselves through this? Well, because. What I have described to you is the future that will be if we don't take action. But it's not the future that must be. Nuclear weapons are not a force of nature. It's not as though there's an asteroid coming at the planet and there's nothing we can do about it. These are little machines. They're about the size of the chairs that you're sitting in. We've dismantled more than 60,000 of these weapons already. We have simply lacked the political will to dismantle the 13,000 that remain in the world. And that's where we come in, because we need to create that political will. And it's important in that context to acknowledge that there is now a growing international movement to do just that. Starting about 12 years ago, countries around the world that do not possess nuclear weapons started to meet to discuss the threat posed to them by the countries which did have nuclear weapons. Many of these countries were in the global south, in Latin America, in Africa. Southeast Asia, areas which had declared themselves to be nuclear weapons-free zones, countries that had had the foresight to ban nuclear weapons from their continents. But they came to understand that they were still at risk because of the outrageously irresponsible behavior of the nine countries which did have nuclear weapons. And over the course of several years, they held a number of major conferences on the medical consequences of nuclear war. It was quite astonishing. The first of these was in uh, 2013 in Norway, it was the first time that an international conference at the government level had ever taken place to examine what would actually happen if the weapons were used. And when the nations of the world that did not possess nuclear weapons began to understand the enormity of the danger they faced, they took action. And in July of 2017, they negotiated with the United Nations the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons a treaty which makes it illegal not just to use nuclear weapons, but simply to possess them. That treaty has now been ratified by more than 65 countries. 
when it passed the threshold of 50 ratifications, <coughs> excuse me, in January of last year, 2021, it took effect. It is now international law. And it has had a huge impact on the international debate, the international conversation about nuclear weapons. But to this date, the nine countries that own the weapons have not taken part in this process. And that becomes the task for the current moment. Mobilizing within these countries, and in particular for us here in the United States, mobilizing here in America to change the policy of those countries. Shortly after the treaty was adopted in 2017, we formed the campaign called Back from the Brink. Uh, it is an effort to build a national movement to bring about fundamental change in U.S. nuclear policy, to convince the leaders of our country that nuclear weapons do not make us safe, that in fact they are the greatest threat to our security, and that they therefore must be eliminated. The campaign is based on a platform of what U.S. nuclear policy should be. There are five planks in the platform. We call, most importantly, for the United States to enter now into negotiations with all eight of the other nuclear armed states for a verifiable, enforceable, time-bound agreement to eliminate the remaining weapons. We call on the United States to take four intermediate steps unilaterally that will lessen the danger of nuclear war as these negotiations proceed and give momentum to the negotiating process. We ask the United States to declare, number one, it will never use nuclear weapons first. It will not start nuclear war. Number two, we ask the United States to change the current regulations which allow the President of the United States to launch nuclear war without anyone else being able to weigh in on this decision. If the President gives the order to launch nuclear war, legally, that's it. No one can contradict that. Third, we ask the United States to take U.S. nuclear weapons off hair trigger alert. I mentioned the hundreds of weapons that we maintain on missiles ready to go. There's no need to do this. It just makes them vulnerable to cyber attack or to an impulsive decision by a leader who does not have the best judgment. And there have been such leaders, and there will be such leaders in the future. And fourth and finally, excuse me, fifth and finally, we call on the United States to abandon the plan to spend $1.7 trillion over the next 30 years enhancing and modernizing every aspect of our nuclear arsenal. The most important part of this plan clearly is the first, the call to begin negotiations for the total elimination of these weapons. If we can get that agreement on that principle, I think all else will follow from that. We can't know if this effort would be successful. It's possible the United States would decide, yes, we're going to do this and that Russia or China or India or Pakistan wouldn't go along. But we don't know that because we've never tried. And it should not be our default position to assume that we cannot succeed because we know what's going to happen if we fail. And so there's every reason to try. And there's absolutely no downside. If the United States proposes such an agreement to the other nations of the world and they decline, we're in the same situation that we're in right now today. We've lost nothing by trying. I think when we talk about this, there's a tendency to feel a bit overwhelmed. This is an enormous threat. It's a huge problem. And each one of us looks at ourselves and says, well, what can I do about this? And in designing Back from the Brink, we took that somewhat into consideration. We, we tried to make this a vehicle that individuals could use to work with the communities that they belong to. The model here is that we get cities and towns, civic groups, faith communities, labor unions, professional associations, to all endorse this platform. And the belief is that if we get enough such endorsements, we'll essentially be creating a national consensus that this is what US policy should be. And that will provide the pressure on our leaders to do the right thing, and it will give them the room to do the right thing. I mean, I, I, one has the sense that, that both Presidents Biden and Obama before him understood the need to eliminate these weapons and simply felt they could not do this politically. There was not enough support to overcome the opposition which they knew they would face. So we have to create a climate where our leaders feel em emboldened to take this action and feel, in fact, that they have to, that we won't let them not. I don't know what the future holds. 
But I will tell you, I'm not a pessimistic person, despite all the things I've described to you tonight. I talk to people about these issues frequently. I think about this a lot. And I believe in my heart that we can succeed, partly because we've come close on occasions before and at times of great danger. At the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis 60 years ago, we all thought we were going to die. And none of us thought that within six months, Khrushchev and Kennedy would sit down and negotiate the partial test ban treaty, set up the hotline, and really initiate an entirely different tone to the discourse between the United States and the Soviet Union. And in the 19, early 1980s, again, many of us thought we were going to die. We did not see any way out of that crisis. And we were shocked and delighted when Gorbachev and Reagan were able to see the danger that they had just courted and the need to change course. So even at this particularly worrisome moment, when the possibility of nuclear war is real in Ukraine, I think there is hope that if we survive this moment, the leaders of Russia, United States, China, will all be sobered by what we have just gone through and be open to the idea that they need to change policy. But we can't count on that. We have to do our part. We have to understand that we are not here today, we have not survived to this point in time because we had wise leaders, or because we had sound technology, or because we had good military doctrine. We're here today because, as former Defense Secretary Robert McNamara once said, quote, we lucked out. It was luck that prevented nuclear war. And we can't assume that our luck is going to continue. In fact, we know it won't continue indefinitely. And so we do need to take action. Now, coming here tonight, listening to what I've had to say, you have all taken onto yourselves an enormous burden by being reminded of things which many of you probably knew already. You have assumed, again, responsibility for doing something about this. If you know the world is at risk and you know that you can help to save it, there's a responsibility to take action. And that's a real burden on all of us. It doesn't feel good to have that kind of responsibility. But I, I think we can look at this also in a somewhat different way. Every one of us wants to do something good with our life. Those of us living today have been given the opportunity, literally, to save the world. And there is nothing better that any person can ever do with his or her life than save the world. So I hope that we can hear all of us this message, face this reality, understand this danger with that attitude, that a challenge has been put before us, that we need to meet that challenge. And that if we do, someday in the not too distant future, each one of us is going to be able to look ourselves in the mirror and say, I helped to save the world. And that's going to feel really good. In the Hebrew Bible, it's reported that God said, behold, I have set before you life and death. Therefore, choose life that you and your children might live. That is literally the choice before all humanity today. And so let's move forward. Let us choose wisely and let us act with courage and determination and perseverance so that indeed our children might live. Thank you. Peter Burgell, a former director of Oregon PeaceWorks. And for years, Oregon PeaceWorks worked hard here in Oregon to, uh, and with other people across the country to make our world a more peaceful one. Uh, we closed our doors in 2013, and now look at the mess we're in, huh? <laughs> so one of the things that we need today, um, and one of the reasons that we're here this evening, is we need good information, information such as the information that we've just received from Ira here tonight. 
The other thing we need, as Iris said, is some action. So uh, every year for the past 33, the Salem Peace Lecture Committee has brought a world-class speaker to Salem to share his or her expertise with us. And we have talked a lot of, about a lot of different subjects, peace, climate change, nonviolence, international relations, environmental stewardship, a lot more. And every year, we ask you to help us do this. And we ask you to do that in two ways. By donating so that we can uh, have this same lecture next year about a different subject. And for all these years, you've come through. You have done it. You have made it possible for us to continue as a peace lecture, uh, as, as a peace lecture committee, and to bring you these lectures. So I'm going to ask you right now, there's going to be some people walking around amongst you, and I'm going to ask you to make a donation, if you possibly can, to uh, help us make, uh, have another peace lecture next year. Uh, if you're watching on, uh, on the live stream, and you can see this, here's how you can donate uh, online. It says HTTPS uh, tinyurl.com PA52PUMW. That will get you to the right place to make a donation if you want to do it that way. But um, right now, if you, uh, if you will deep, dig, dig, dig deep into your pockets, uh, and make a donation, that will be great. The other thing I want to ask you to do is, if you look in your program, you'll see a little sheet that looks like this. Prior to the uh, pandemic, we had an organization here called Nuclear Abolition Salem. And unfortunately, because it was kind of a fledgling organization, when the pandemic hit, it kind of fell apart. And we want to pull it back together. Why? You just heard why. <laughs> it's made pretty clear why we need to take action here in Salem as well as in every other city in this, in this country and around the world. So if you will pull out this sheet and fill it out for us and put it into the containers here uh, as they're coming around, that'll be great. Please do this, because if we don't have a few names, we aren't going to be able to do very much. Uh, there's just a few of us that are taking action now, and there's not, a, there's not enough. We don't have a critical mass, so we need that. Also, there's a place for you to check. If you haven't been getting Peace Lecture information, please give us your email address, and we'll be able to get you that. We're not going to do it by, by mail any further, any longer. So. Uh, if you will do those two things, I think we can move forward and uh, have, a, have a good nuclear abolition presence right here in the city of Salem. So with that, let me move all along to the, uh, to the next part of the program, which is your opportunity to ask Ira the questions that I'm sure have come up in your mind. So uh, just uh, come up to one of these microphones here and uh, tell us what your questions are, and Ira is uh, more than qualified to answer them. And the question that I want to pose to you all um, is wh what do you think you can do? Um, the, as I mentioned, the Back from the Brink campaign is uh, predicated on getting individuals to mobilize the communities that they live in so far around the country, more than 60 cities have passed resolutions endorsing this campaign, including Salem, also Portland, um, other major cities around the country like Boston, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, uh, and many others. Um, we also have a resolution now in the United States House of Representatives that was introduced by Representative Earl Blumenauer and Representative James McGovern from Massachusetts. And we're trying to get other members of the House uh, to co-sponsor that resolution. We're hoping that a resolution, a companion resolution, will be in introduced in the United States Senate and um, have been in conversation with Senator Merkley, who uh, his staff have indicated there's very significant interest on his part in doing this, 
uh, one thing that I would, would ask of you all to do uh, is to call Senator Merkley's office tomorrow and say you've heard that he's interested in supporting the Back from the Brink campaign with the Senate resolution and you encourage him to do that. So uh, questions that people might have or comments that you want to make about the situation or ideas that you have about how we deal with this crisis. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. My name is Ricky. I'm from the Marshall Island. I'm one of the victims. Grew up after World War II. I grew up in Jaluj. Jaluj was one of the Japanese uh, headquarters during the uh, World War II. And when I grew up in Image, Image is the uh, center of a Japanese military base in the Marshall Island. And today, when I grew up, I see all the uh, nuclear thing from the bomb from the World War II. And they are still there in the Marshall Island. And I didn't know about the nuclear until I come to college in the 80s. And I started to take some course about the history, political science, anthropology. And right now, I stand here on behalf of my people from the Marshall Island, we are, we are a victim from the nuclear, from the nuclear from Bikini Island. And right up the island, Marshallese people are sick. My mom died because of the cancer. My father died when I was three months. And I have three brothers got cancer too. And my sister. And this is my request today. What the BS are going to do to help the people around the world. And if we can maybe ask Russia and the United States to stop our nuclear war, maybe we can be on the peace. Because now today I was looking at the uh, news on the internet about the uh, Russian maybe want to drop the bomb on nuclear uh, on a Ukraine place, and maybe Americans want to stop it. And now we are here to ask ourselves what we can do to stop the nuclear in the world. During the World War II, Americans dropped the bomb in Japan, and there was a peace between Japanese and American. And today we are facing a lot of the same problem. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for, for bringing to our, uh, renewing our con uh, focus on the terrible injustices that have already taken place in the nuclear weapons era, both through the bombings at Hiroshima and Nagasaki and through the extensive testing of nuclear weapons uh, in the South Pacific, also in the US Southwest, in Kazakhstan, in Algeria, in Australia. Um, there is already a large community of people around the world who suffer the effects of the nuclear weapons era. And it is critical that we learn from the terrible things that have happened to these populations and make sure they never happen again. Thank you. Uh, yes, doctor. Um, my question is what would, um the result be of, say, a very small uh, nuclear attack by Russia on Ukraine with, say, up to six of these tactical nuclear weapons um, if there was no response from the West. But, I mean, even with, say, six tactical we uh, nuclear weapons, how much destruction could we uh, expect from something like that? Yeah. Th there's been a lot of discussion in the press uh, over the last several weeks about tactical nuclear weapons, and I think the most important thing to understand is that the, a tactical nuclear weapon is not necessarily a small nuclear weapon. The difference between tactical weapons and strategic weapons is what they are designed to be used for. Tactical weapons are designed to be used on the battlefield, uh, you know, against a tank formation or perhaps against a, a, an aircraft carrier at sea, something like that. Strategic weapons are designed to be used to blow up cities and industrial sites. Some tactical weapons are quite small. Others are up to 10 times bigger than the Hiroshima bomb. So what would happen in, if a tactical weapon were used in Ukraine is it depends on the size, it depends what the target is. But the real concern is that any use of even a single tactical nuclear weapon would lead to severe escalation. In the past, the US government has conducted extensive computer tabletop type war games examining what would happen if either Russia used a nuclear weapon against a NATO state or NATO used a nuclear weapon against Russia. And in every one of those war games, it has escalated to all-out nuclear war. 
Now, the situation in Ukraine is somewhat different. It is in, Russia would be using a nuclear weapon against a country which does not have nuclear weapons and is not part of a nuclear alliance. I'm sure the U.S. government has carried out a number of war game studies over the last few months, but they have not made public those results, and I don't think we know, none of us, without that kind of clearance, know what those uh, studies have shown. But so it, it's possible that the Russians could use one or two relatively small uh, nuclear weapons against Ukraine and cause some terrible local damage, depending on the size of the bomb, and it wouldn't escalate. But I certainly don't think we can bet on that. And I think once a single nuclear weapon is used, really all bets are off. Uh, we have not crossed that line since Nagasaki, and we don't know what's on the other side. Uh, and I think we have to assume, given the experiences that we have studied, that if any nuclear weapons are used in Ukraine, the danger of escalation to large-scale nuclear war just explodes. And, and there is, there's a ter it's terribly important that that be avoided. Thank you. I'm just wondering if this lecture will be available online at some point. Yes, it will. The lecture will be made available online, and all the other uh, peace lecture lectures of the past are also available online. Uh, we're being filmed right over there right now, and uh, so that's going to be posted on the Willamette University uh, website, and also with uh, Raymond Duke Sears Big Picture Productions. Uh, we have all the previous peace lectures uh, online there, so you can go to that. Uh, Raymond, is it bigpick.com? Org. Bigpick.org. That's where the, uh, all the f former peace lectures are and where this one will be as well, as, and uh, I don't know, well, I'm at the site as well. Another question. Yeah, right over here. Uh, I have two questions, so one is, um, you, you had mentioned nine states or, or nine uh, countries with nuclear. Is that likely the number? I, I mean, is there ones that we don't know about or there ones that are going to more likely? So is nine really where we think we're landing and will be? So that's the first question. And then the second question is um, back to Ukraine and specifically with the nuclear facility that's been taken over. And I'm wondering what's the kind of the scenarios that are being of concern of, of that uh, facility being taken over? Uh, with regards to the number, there are currently nine nuclear armed states in the world. Uh, the United States and Russia between them have about 90% of the nuclear weapons. The other countries which have nuclear uh, arms are uh, in order in which they acquired them. The United Kingdom, France, China, uh, Israel, India, Pakistan, and North Korea. Uh, Iran is very close to the ability to build nuclear weapons, but they have not yet, so far as we know. And we're not aware of any other countries that are uh, actively pursuing building nuclear weapons. There are certainly a number of other countries that could very rapidly. Japan, South Korea, uh, Germany uh, could develop nuclear weapons very quickly if they chose to. If the Iranians develop nuclear weapons, several countries in the Middle East, uh, Turkey, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia have indicated that they would consider developing nuclear weapons. There are also um, four countries that have given up nuclear weapons, uh, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, and Belarus, uh, all when the Soviet Union broke up, had nuclear weapons on their territory, which they could have held on to, and they all returned them to Russia. And South Africa developed nuclear weapons uh, in the 1980s and uh, dismantled those weapons uh, uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union. So we're, that's sort of the picture right now. One of the things about nuclear weaponry is that, um, and this has important implications for any agreement to try to eliminate the weapons, that they're fairly hard to build. Um, not th the science isn't that complicated. I mean, you can go online and you can find directions on how you assemble a nuclear weapon if you have fissile material, plutonium or highly enriched uranium. But it's quite difficult to produce those materials. It's a big industrial process. And it's not something that's easily hidden. 
you know, biological weapons you can make in your bathtub, chemical weapons you can cook up in your kitchen. But nuclear weapons, it's, it's a big industrial process to make the fissile material. And so it, it would be relatively easy, given the technology that's available today, to monitor the globe and know that no one is doing this. Um, with regards to the situation at the nuclear power plant, the Zaporizhia plant, I think is what you were asking about in Ukraine. This is the largest nuclear power plant in Europe. There are six uh, reactors that make up the facility. And it was occupied by the Russian invasion forces relatively early on in the war. It's an extraordinarily dangerous situation. There's an enormous amount of radioactive material. This plant has been operating for, I believe it's close to 30 years. And the longer a nuclear power plant operates, the more high level radioactive material it generates. So there's a huge inventory of spent fuel rods as well as the fuel rods that are currently in the reactors. The spent fuel rods in the uh, storage pools actually have a much larger inventory of radioactive material and are a much greater threat. All of these fuel rods need to be cooled continuously to keep them from melting down, exploding, and releasing their radioactive material. And the cooling system could be interrupted by a direct hit on one of the, the plants, one of the reactors, or simply by the loss of electricity. The way nuclear reactors are designed, they are dependent on electricity from outside of their own facility to, and this is true around the world, I don't know why, uh, to maintain their cooling. If the electric grid around Zaporizhia goes down, there are diesel generators at the site which will cool the plants for a number of days until the diesel fuel runs out. But when it does, then the material will melt down and there could be a gigantic release of radioactivity, much greater than Chernobyl or Fukushima. And this has caused enormous concern in Ukraine, in Russia, and all over Europe, as it should. Uh, and it, it really underlines a, a, a fundamental danger inherent in the building of nuclear power plants. These are essentially weapons of mass destruction. Uh, even though you don't get a nuclear explosion, the uh, release of radioactivity would be enormous, and it, and it would something you'd have to consider uh, a weapon of mass destruction if one were detonated. And so, you know, countries that build them preposition these on their own territory, making them available to potential enemies to attack at a time of the enemy's choosing. Uh, it's a very, very uh, bad part of the situation. Somewhat distinct from the danger of nuclear weapons being used, but but very, very bad at also. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Brenda Bunce, and uh, I really appreciate you being here. Um, this is, for me, one of the most important things that we could be talking about, and I'm just shocked that more people aren't taking part. Um, uh, I'm, I'm really unclear just how to um, unite people in a movement to all kind of be carrying the same message towards our government to be to not be sleepwalking into Armageddon, as they say, I feel. I, um, and so this back from the brink, um, is does it kind of lay out, I, I know we, we want our governments to follow this, but is there a way for us to move together to put the pressure on, on and, and to form togetherness? For, yeah. Is that uh, the same message? Um, there is. I mean, first of all, I, something I should have mentioned when I was speaking earlier, the, the campaign has a terrific website, uh, www.preventnuclearwar, easy to remember, preventnuclearwar.org, uh, that explains the platform and explains how the campaign works, uh, lists all the many organizations that have signed on. Um, I think for, for an individual here tonight, the thing I think to do is to sort of take a little inventory. What organizations, what communities do you belong to? in which you could raise this issue. So faith communities have been a very important part of this campaign so far. At the national level, and, uh, the Episcopal Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Methodist Church, uh, United Church of Christ, the Unitarian Universalist Movement, the Jewish Reconstructionist Movement have all endorsed this campaign. Um, Pax Christi within the Catholic community has endorsed the campaign. Uh, and many local uh, churches, mosques, synagogues have endorsed the campaign as well. Uh, and would encourage you, if you belong to a faith community and your uh, local community has not endorsed the campaign, please work within that community to do that. Other kinds of groups that have, uh, are taking a position, Rotary Clubs have started to endorse the campaign. 
um, labor unions have started to endorse the campaign, um, professional associations, um, social justice organizations, and, and, and climate groups. Uh, the Sierra Club, the National Resource Defense Council have endorsed the campaign. Um, civil rights groups like the Hip Hop Caucus have endorsed the campaign. And uh, so it, there is a place also for individuals to register on, their, on the, the site, their personal support. But we really view this as a way of providing a way that people can go out to their community and say, look, here's something we can do together as a community. Uh, we can take a, a stand on this. And I think that's really the key to, key to how this is going to succeed. That's how the freeze worked. We got lots and lots of different communities, um, political communities, social communities, faith communities, to say this is what should happen. And that was the way we were able to transmit that message effectively to our government leaders. It's also fine to directly approach our, our leaders. As I mentioned, there was a, a resolution in Congress and approaching uh, the congressional represent representatives that, that you all have uh, and asking them to be co-sponsors of the House resolution. It's HRES 1185. And again, there's information about that on the website, but HRES 1185, uh, uh, asking members of the House of Representatives to sign on to this um, it is very worthwhile. And I think it's critically important that, you know, I'm, I'm just delighted to hear that, that a, a committee specifically to address the nuclear weapons issue uh, is being put back together in, in Salem, or rejuvenated, I guess is a better word. Uh, and if you're here in Salem, I would strongly urge people to, to join in, in that effort. Yeah. You know, one of the things that's really interesting right now is that the city of Corvallis has a resolution before the city council right now to not only support back from the brink, but to divest the whole city from any investment in nuclear weapons. Yeah, right. And we went to our city council with just the back from the brink type resolution, similar to the one that we did in 2019 at the state level. The, the, the state of Oregon, incidentally, is a back from the brink state. It's one of, I think, six that have, have done that. Uh, so we've got a head start there. But our city council just went for the back from the brink resolution. We didn't go so far the first time as to ask them to divest. But we could do that. Uh, so that's one thing that, that's one thing that the uh, uh, nuclear abolition Salem could do if, uh, if I get you to sign these things and hand them in. Speaking, uh, speaking of divestment, one of the, the organizations that we've tried most to work in recently is Rotary, um, just because of its enormous international uh, scope. It's uh, a million and a half members in almost every country in the world. And last summer, the summer of 2021, uh, the Rotary Foundation uh, did make a decision to divest completely from all companies that are involved in making nuclear weapons. So uh, th there's, there's some real potential uh, to this. Divesting is hard. Um, these are hard campaigns because it's technically hard for a large, like a city fund, to get itself out of the nuclear industry. They, people tend to invest, these funds tend to invest in mutual funds, which invest in many stocks, and they're just technically, it's hard work for them to do. But it sends a very powerful message when you're able to get a community to make such a decision. And it would be great if Corvallis passes its resolution and if Salem takes further steps and divests as well. Uh, one more question uh, on behalf of the people of uh, Marshall Island, people of uh, Bikini, Ronglap, Hanewata, and uh, Uturk. These people are uh, homeless. They don't have any home. After the bomb drop on their land, they move them from their land and put them somewhere around uh, Marshall Island. But when they live on those island, land, they are a small island, maybe they are about one mile long, maybe a mile wide, and there are many of them, their kids and families. And in our home, you cannot have a land unless you talk with the landowner or you lease the land, even though you lease the land. But the land is belong to the landowner. And a lot of people from Rockland and people from Bikini, they are now living on the land as a lease. And they don't have any right on this land. And they are 
like a homeless here in America, you know, when you look at the homeless, they are push their cart. But in America, you got shelter to provide housing and whatever the people need here in the U.S. In our home, we don't have any shelter. And the only thing in order to get them to have a land, they should talk with the landowner, and then they can live on the land. But the land is limited. They cannot do whatever they want. They cannot build their house, whatever, even their kids. And that's what I'm asking if you, VHR can help these people to negotiate with the United States government to give them land in the United States, maybe a hundred acre from Bruce Island. Because today, they don't have any land. And they just live on the island as homeless, no place to go. And if the crew here want to help, the people out there, because I don't know what the uh, Marshall government deal with the United States government on behalf of these people, from they call them poor adults, people who are affected or from the bomb, when they put the bomb around, around 50 something, whatever. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for, for that further testimony. I, I mean, one of the most effective ways, I think, of, of reaching people uh, about the need to eliminate nuclear weapons is, is to have them understand the suffering they've already caused and something which we also need to do in addition to get of nu getting rid of the weapons that we have before yet more people are made victims and to try to address the, the, the needs of the people who have been victimized already. Um, people from the Marshall Islands, um, downwinders in Nevada and Utah, um, the people in Kazakhstan have been terribly treated uh, by the Soviet Union during the period of testing there. And of course, the people in Japan uh, who suffered the direct effects of the nuclear weapons. And Habakusha from Japan have been, you know, among the most eloquent and powerful advocates for measures to eliminate nuclear weapons so that this never happens again, as have people uh, from the many indigenous communities that were particularly uh, affected by nuclear testing. Uh, testing was not, we didn't test nuclear weapons in, in, in New York or Virginia. We tested them primarily in, in places uh, where communities had less political power and were not able to stop the testing from taking place. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for the moving speech and, and the important information. So I'm really grateful to be here tonight. Um, my, my question came to my, to my mind, uh, it, it's about nuclear, use of nuclear energy. And is it your belief that, you know, the dangers inherent in that, it, is, is that something too that we could work to abolish? Do you see those things as, as separate, you know, working to abolish weapons or, or the nuclear in industry itself? Thank you. Uh, I mean, I think nuclear power and nuclear weapons are, are somewhat separate problems, but they're obviously intimately related. Uh, there are many arguments against nuclear power. Uh, the the low-level radiation that is constantly emanating from these plants, the fact that we have no way of storing the waste um, that is generated by these plants, uh, the potential for catastrophic accidents like Fukushima and Chernobyl. Uh, the greatest, uh, I think, objection to nuclear power is that the same technology that enables a country to build nuclear reactors enables them to build nuclear bombs. And the Israeli, Indian, Pakistani, and North Korean weapons programs were all developed out of reactors that were supposed to be for civilian purposes. So I think there's a very strong argument to eliminate these, weapon, uh, these uh, reactors as a source of power. We certainly should not be even thinking of building any more of them how quickly we can phase out the ones that currently exist. Um, th it needs to be done as quickly as it possibly can. And obviously that, that's somewhat complicated by the desire not to burn more fossil fuels either. Um, but but these, these are excessively dangerous. It's, the, 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 it's not an acceptable risk to continue to maintain these plants. And we need to, to get rid of them as quickly as we possibly can. So in the freeze campaign that you mentioned, um, I noticed that there seemed to be like a specific coalition of organizations and work that was put forth to 
encouraged the administration at the time to step back from nuclear um, weapons. Um, some of the folks that were included was like the American Association of School Administrators, American Nurses Association, AFL-CIO, and so I know that you've, you've mentioned that there's like faith denominations and labor unions that are getting on board, but I was just wondering if there was more of a coordinated national coalition effort to um, put pressure on the administration because um, I guess even in the Reagan administration, they, they found this coordinated effort to be a widespread view in the administration that the freeze was a dagger pointed at the heart of the administration's defense program. So I think um, if there isn't like some sort of coordinated coalition that it could be useful similar to how we've seen with the Biden administration at the level of like uh, student loans or uh, marijuana convictions. Well, we're not quite there yet. Uh, we want that from the brink to be a dagger pointed at the heart of current nuclear policy. Um, but we're not, we're quite frankly, we're not there yet. Uh, we're kind of where the freeze was maybe in 1981 or, or early 82. And we need to get quickly to where the freeze was by 1983 and 1984. Um, there is a national steering group that is running the freeze campaign. And we are hoping to enlarge that group. We're hoping to enlarge this campaign. And we're hoping that within a year or so, uh, back from the brink, we'll have the same uh, uh, political power uh, that the freeze campaign ultimately came to have. Uh, but we're not quite there yet. But that's why you all have to do your part and why I have to keep doing my part, because we need to build this campaign. We need to do it quickly. If there are no further questions, I would just want to close with one other observation. Um, when we, you all leave tonight, uh, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to start forgetting the terrible things that I described to you, uh, which is perfectly understandable. This is very unpleasant stuff. And the way the human mind works is to put unpleasant stuff out of mind. Uh, it's not just simple forgetting. It's, it's an active a erasure that goes on. Um, and we, we, to some extent, we need to do this or we'd all go crazy. But I, I would ask of you, don't let that happen, please. Um, you have to hold this information, as painful as it is, someplace in your brain, in the part of your brain that motivates your behavior. The problem that we are dealing with today is that we are going through a global near-death experience and we're not acting as though we are. We're all going about our lives as though this danger did not exist. And that's what really has to change. The thing that is, to me, most frightening about this situation is the fact that we are not yet where, we, where the freeze was uh, by 1983, that we do not have millions of people who understand this problem. And we need to do everything we possibly can to change that situation. That means every one of us who does know about the problem has got to take action. You have to do that outreach to the communities that you belong to. You have to write letters to the editor. You have to contact your, your congressional delegation. You have to push in every way that's appropriate for you in your given situation. There's, a, there's an old proverb that says that no one is expected to do the entire job, but neither is anyone expected or allowed to step back from that portion of the job which is theirs to do. This isn't on each of us individually. None of us can do this by ourselves. But all of us have to work on this together. And if we do, I am confident that we can succeed because we have the example of history. We know that we've done this once before. We're not asking ourselves to do something impossible. We're asking ourselves to just repeat a success we've already seen. So I hope people will go forth tonight from, from this meeting uh, with a sense of, of fear. Fear is an important uh, uh, emotion when there's a real danger. But more than that, a sense of real commitment to doing something about this. The future of our children, the future of our planet is in our hands. And it is really up to us what happens going forward from now. So again, thanks very much for your attention tonight and for all the work which I know you're going to do. Thank you. Friends, again, thank you for coming out um, tonight. A uh, couple of reminders, um, one, Oh, the form is gone, but 
for donations, for live stream. If you want to bring it up, you can. I think we can get it on camera for those on live stream. Um, we invite those donations uh, to support the work of the Peace, Salem Peace Lecture Committee. Um, for the forms, um, for the abolition, you have the, yeah, does that work? And then for those of us present here in the, in the theater, the forms um, to prevent nuclear disaster for the nuclear abolition group, there'll be a basket out at the welcome table where you can also place those if you haven't already submitted your forms. Um, for any students who may be watching online or those um, who might continue to be interested and want to ask additional questions that come up, tomorrow we're holding a um, combo, which stands for convocation, but a conversation with Dr. Helsand at 11.30 um, in the afternoon in Cone Chapel, which is just across the yard uh, from where we are now, um, to um, dig a little deeper in a, in a little bit more of an intimate setting. So you're all invited to join us there as well. And now in closing, um, let us leave this place mindful, mindful of the past, mindful of the ongoing threat of nuclear war and destruction, mindful of the earth, mindful of the environment and of climate change, Mindful of the uses and potential abuses of power. Let us be mindful of the fragilities of life. Mindful of our hearts and mindful of our responsibility, our activism, seeking peace May it be so. Thank you.